So now I will introduce our speaker for today. So Dr. Marie-Elise Perron is professor in epidemiology at the Institut National de la Recherche Scientifique of the University of Quebec in Montreal and adjunct professor at the School of Public Health of the University of Montreal. She's highly involved in activities at the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the cancer research arm of the World Health Organization, and she is the Canadian representative on this scientific council. So without further ado, I will leave the floor to Dr. Perron and she can begin her presentation. Okay, okay, well, let me just start. And well, I'm now that I have the full screen for myself, uh, well, it's a pleasure to uh, be here today. I'd like to thank you uh, all for the invitation. It's, uh, it's a pleasure because I've been working on prostate cancer for the last 23 years. Uh, this is the really the essence of my research program, and I'm an epidemiologist, which is a little something that you might not hear so much as part of those meetings, because maybe treatment or you know follow up after cancer is more often what you hear about. But uh, I'm happy to share with you all that I know about prostate cancer. Um, just to give you a background or, or why I'm I'm there. Um, it, it basically, uh, when I did my PhD uh, way back, uh, it was on breast cancer and obesity, and I thought it was fascinating. But when came the time to choose something to work on, on you know, in my career, I I was thinking. I said, oh, we know a few things about breast cancer, and then I started looking into prostate cancer and realized how little we know. It's, it's truly a black box and it, it was 20 years ago, it's better, but it's moving quite slowly uh, to my, and there are not that many people that look into causes of prostate cancer. Basically I'm probably, and, and my actually uh, focus is the environment and I'm probably one of the few in the world that just do work on environment and prostate cancer, which is something I will share with you. It's uh, something quite, uh, rather new, uh, not uh, so well studied, and uh, I'll, I'll try to share that with you. But uh, I'm, I'm glad that I'm able to share my my knowledge with you because you know you are the reason why I do that. You know I work my my weekends and we and trying to to try to make a little difference in the system and try to make uh, you know provide tools for prevention for our future generations and our, our you know the people around us. So. Um, so thank you again. I'll, I'll get started uh, just by sharing my screen. Okay, so let's try and see what we're going to talk about today. Uh, well, first of all, I want to just brush, you know, a picture of the descriptive epidemiology of prostate cancer. How does that change the, you know, the incidence over time, the mortality, where is this distributed around the world, and what are the hypotheses that we can maybe derive from that? Then we'll talk about what I think we know about the causes of prostate cancer. There's many questions still in the air, and there are some factors that we know for sure, and others that are under suspicion, and for which some of some of which we know a little bit more than others. Some are more into the oh wow, this is new. Let's try to explore that. So I'll try to go and brush um, a picture of that. And then I was intending to show something a little different than what you might have heard before about prostate cancer, which is environmental factors. Because as I said earlier, this is really my area of, of expertise. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you about what I think is important from the environmental point of view in prostate cancer risk. And we'll present example of the, the work that is ongoing in my group. And I just thought at the end that I'll brush a, a, a few ideas about prostate cancer screening, although I'm, re I'm not a physician, so I'm not here to, uh, you know, give you uh, advice on that at all. But I just thought that I brushed a, a few uh, a few slides on that, or maybe just one or two. So here we go. So I need to change here, probably. <laughs> God, how do I change? This is funny. Sorry, um, if you just use your like um, keyboard, just like the, the side, so yes. Ah, how about that? Yeah, oh, I, I just didn't push enough. Okay, so let's start about the descriptive epidemiology of prostate cancer. So prostate cancer is the second most common cancer in men after lung cancer in the world. So what we see here in the dark colors are those areas where it's more common, more 
frequently diagnosed. And these are the figures of 2020, but they must be quite similar to the ones that we have now. And so what we see here is that North America uh, is one of the areas where there's a lot of diagnosis of prostate cancer. There's also, we can see that there are things happening in Brazil. And uh, we see that Europe also, also has a lot of diagnosis. Of, uh, so the incidence rates are high in, in area of uh, Western Europe. And there's also uh, some areas here that are common in Africa. And uh, I don't really see it because it's behind my screen, but we, we see that also in Australia and New Zealand, there's also high rates. Now at the other end of the spectrum, uh, the areas where it's much less common uh, are uh, include uh, the Asian countries. Uh, so uh, Japan, China is, is much less common. And um, so just to get that started, we might wonder what, what's behind this. And we could think that it could be a, a detection uh, a situation that is in the countries where it's, the incidence rates are, are high. This reflects more detection, more screening, more uh, and that. But uh, studies that have been done on that suggest that it's not, it might explain some of it, but not all of it. So it's already a clue to get started into, oh, these countries have high, higher rates and the Asian countries have lower rates, which, which is uh, quite interesting. And 68% um, of it uh, occurs in, in more developed regions. Now, this is the map for uh, the counterpart for the mortality rates across the world. And then we can, can see that um, the, the North America is doing quite well, quite good. Uh, Europe is also doing quite good. And of course, the, the mortality rates in Asia are low because the incidence rates are low. Uh, but we see that we're not very good with what's going on in, in Africa, whereas the, 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 the incidence rates are, are quite high in, in, those, in those countries. Now, I, I'm just uh, presenting here uh, what are the incidence and mortality rates of prostate cancer over time between 1984 and 2020. And what we have uh, in, in blue is the incidence of prostate cancer. So what we can see here for, for the incidence is that it's, you know, it kind of increased a touch, a touch, and then it, it's going down now a little bit. And we see two peaks here of incidence, and uh, they they uh, reflect uh, uh, situations that are quite uh, clear. The first peak is that because uh, PSA was introduced in 1988, then lots of cases appeared in the population because they were found out with the, the tests that were you know being used in in the clinics. So this peak represents all the cases that were there, but were found when the PSA was um, introduced. And then once they found a lot of cases, then after that, there were not that many more and it went to a natural curve. So it just went down because all this num large number of cases that were around were found. And after that, well, uh, it came back to the normal curve. We do have another peak in 2001 and you may remember that uh, Alan Brock, which was our former Minister of Health at the federal level, was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and it was an early stage prostate cancer. And he was encouraging people in the population to get tested. And so he had a good effect, I would say a good effect, a strong effect in the sense that many men in Canada decided to get tested and they were found out, some of them, to have uh, prostate cancer. So this is the other uh, kind of peak that we observe in, in, in incidence. But generally what we see now is that it's going down a little bit. For mortality, um, well, we see that it, there were some slight increases, but very modest uh, up to the late 1990s, and then it's coming down. So I think it reflects uh, a better treatment, earlier diagnosis, and, and so on. So the, this is good news is that, you know, the prognosis uh, is, is improving. Uh, now, the uh, the incidence in Canada today, uh, because we were talking about the world, now in Canada, it's the most commonly diagnosed ca cancer in men uh, in Canada. And 
it uh, it represents 118 cases per, per 100,000 men in 2022. And if we look at the proportion of all cancers, uh, we see that prostate cancer represents 20% of all cancers in men, uh, followed by lung and uh, colorectal cancer. For survival, uh, we see that the five-year survival uh, rate is uh, 91%, which is considered very good. And then uh, it, uh, the mortality by cancer is the, it occurs most often for lung cancer, followed by colorectal and prostate takes the third rank. But again, the prognosis is, is really good. Um, now, it doesn't mean that we should not study prevention, even if the prognosis is good, because the morbidity that is associated with the disease or even the diagnosis, learning that you have a diagnosis of prostate cancer or the treatment is not something, it's something we want to avoid. So prevention in the first place, it, it should be uh, supported very much for any uh, disease, even uh, one that is uh, that has very good prognosis, because uh, it, it's associated with um, a series of, of side effects that are not uh, desirable. Now we'll move on to what are the causes of prostate cancer. And uh, you'll see that there are many questions still going on. Um, the risk factors that we describe as established are age. It increases exponentially with age. It's rare before age 40 and then rises rapidly after the age of 50. And uh, about six in 10 cases of prostate cancer are found in men uh, older than 65 years of age. The other established risk factors is uh, uh, coming from a, a sub-Saharan and African ancestry, whom have a much higher risk than others uh, to have prostate cancer, whereas those of Asian descent seem to have a lower risk. And, and the reasons for that, we can we immediately think of, of uh, genetics. And there's a lot of work going on to try to figure out if it's genetics. But I, I, in my view, I, I mean, they are identifying uh, uh, genetic risk factors uh, that are explaining some of the dis disparities in, in, uh, in ancestries. But there's other things because people from the different ancestries also share environmental uh, you know, factor, they share a culture, they, sh they share food habits and so on. So the answer, you know, the explanation behind this is probably a mix of genetics and environmental exposure. And when I talk about the environment is everything that is not genetic. So we can talk about diet, we can talk about physical activity, it can be exposure of chemicals in the environment, it can be many, many things, anything that moves around the individual. The most, uh, the other uh, risk factor that is established is family history. Uh, we know that uh, the risk increase if, if one has a first degree relative, father, brother, or son, that has been diagnosed with prostate cancer. And uh, the familial risk that we observe at this point it is explained by about one, one third of it is explained by genetic factors, although research is going on and, and gradually they're finding more, but it's we can see that the familial risk at this point is not clearly associated with only with genetics. There has to be other things and uh, it could be shared uh, environment by family members, shared diet, shared uh, culture, shared, you know, uh, shared uh, risk factors of other types. Now, one uh, interesting observation comes from the descriptive of epidemiology of prostate cancer is that if you uh, look at population uh, who live in Asia, and I said that they have low rates, low incidence rates of prostate cancer, if this population migrate to area that do have high rates of prostate cancer, they acquire the rates of the host country. So their rates change according to the environment. If the disease was strictly genetic, the, raise, the rates would remain the same, but we do see that they change according to the environment where people live. So the big question is, what is it that in the environment that actually changes around the individual that makes 
you know, difference in their incidence rates. Uh, so these observations are quite important because they suggest that uh, the that the effect of the environment is, I mean, it, prostate cancer is not a random disease. It's not necessarily only a, a genetic disease. We do think that the, env the environment from, you know, a, a large point of view, like environmental lifestyle and so on, are important in explaining the disease, but it's not easy to find out what it is. And I'm going to talk about what I found, you know, in the literature, what are the, the, the suspected risk factors, those that have, I believe, the strongest evidence. It, this changes with time. We find new things and so on. But, and I've, I've sort of categorized the risk factor according to the, the amount of information, you know, that gives us a, a strong feeling that these are actually important. So I would think at this point that weight is probably one of the, the, the risk factor for prostate cancer that is that has the strongest evidence. Uh, so it can be body mass index, which is the overall uh, uh, obesity, waist to circumference, which is the abdominal obesity or waist to hip ratio that is also representative of the uh, uh, abdominal uh, uh, obesity. It has been associated with increased risk of aggressive or advanced prostate cancer. We're not able really much to say what's going on with the less aggressive form of the disease, but there do seem to have lots of studies that do show an association between body, uh, body mass index and, and obesity and uh, aggressive prostate cancer. Uh, there are hormones that are changing um, ac according to the uh, to obesity, and uh, we think that uh, maybe some of them, uh, IGF, it could be uh, uh, estrogens, androgens, change things that change with obesity that could be uh, influential because we do know that the prostate is is regulated by hormones, and it could be that this regulate this regulated shouldn't there might uh, influence uh, the risk of, of aggressive prostate cancer. The other factor is height. Uh, we do seem to see lots of study that, uh, but it's still controversial, but it, it uh, overall there's there seems to be a, a, the idea that uh, the, the, the developmental factor leading to greater uh, linear growth, which is adult height, increase the risk of prostate cancer. So we do think that early life exposures uh, to uh, factors that are, you know, may, that could be maybe modulate hormone levels or so on, could be important because uh, adult height, height is a marker of genetic and environmental factors uh, that occur uh, during pregnancy, childhood, and adolescence. So, this were these were the factors that I think have the strong ev evidence. There are some that have uh, other factors that have, for which there's some evidence. It's not as solid, uh, but if you look at uh, what uh, the report from the World Cancer Research Fund International, which is a big, big panel that uh, review all the studies that have been done on the subject and evaluate if there are issues with some study and, and overall they, they produce sort of a summary of what they think is, is coming out from all those studies. And for dairy products, there is some evidence that eating a lot of dairies uh, might increase the risk of prostate cancer. Whereas for calcium, and it's it's probably related because dairy products contribute calcium, uh, some studies suggest that the men consuming lots of calcium food or supplement could have a higher risk of prostate cancer. The suspected risk factor, again, and those that have some evidence, we have vitamin E. Uh, vitamin E uh, has been associated with uh, prostate cancer risk in, in a number of studies, and it can be for, found in diet, uh, oil seeds, spinach, avocado, olive oil. So it, it could be that there's something there. Uh, you might have heard about selenium. Uh, we there's some studies that suggest that low plasma selenium concentration could also increase the risk. And selenium can be found in the diet, uh, in seafood, in organs, in Brazil nuts, and it's influenced actually by the amount of, of the, the, this metal in the sand 
So, um, so basically, uh, we, we do think that there could be a, a possibility that uh, selenium uh, reduces prostate cancer risk. You may have heard uh, about pesticides and, and farmers. Um, so uh, there's an excess risk of prostate cancer in agricultural populations. And this is puzzling because those populations usually have lower risk of other conditions. They usually have a lower risk of cardiovascular disease and so on and, and, and other cancers, but they have higher risk of prostate cancer. And this has led to a number of studies that are, are conducted on what do farmer you know, encounter in their, in their lives. And of course, one thinks about post pesticides and there's also employees in pesticide production plants that have been found to have excess risk of prostate cancer. So and, and there are some uh, pesticides that seem more important than other in terms of the association with prostate cancer. One that is quite uh, um, oftenly uh, referred to now is chlordecone, uh, which is mostly used in French island of the Martinique and Guadeloupe for banana plantations. And those populations have very high risk of prostate cancer. And uh, we do think, and more and more, we're trying to collect data in those populations because it does seem that this particular pesticide uh, is, um, is a problem. And it's no longer used, but we can see that we want to make sure that we know about it so that it, we never use it again. And we want to make sure that uh, this is, so there's, there's ongoing research on that. And also or organochlorine and organophosphate uh, insecticides that are used in agriculture, home gardens, and uh, vet veterinary practice have also been associated with prostate cancer. Although the evidence is, you know, it's 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 that suspected level. We cannot say for sure, but uh, there's a fair bit of ongoing research uh, on that on that aspect on the pesticides and the farming. Red meat, you may, you may uh, have heard the, that the, there's some suspicion around it. There's limited evidence. Uh, I mean, some studies have found a, a positive association between red meat and prostate cancer. And the red meats have been uh, classified by the International G Agency for Research on Cancer based on the, evidence of, on the evidence on colorectal cancer, whereas for prostate, it's we're not clear about it. Uh, and and so there's still research going on. It could be related to the high temperature uh, you, that we use to cook the meats and it makes some transformation in the meat and the processing also of the meat could be uh, what is the, the underlying problem. But uh, so there's a, a fair bit of research ongoing to try to, to look at processed foods and uh, if, if uh, the type of cooking influences uh, you know, how meat is associated with prostate cancer risk. There's lycopene that you probably have heard of as well, and it's still in the category of limited evidence. Uh, so there's a, a protective effect that has been observed in a number of studies, not all. And uh, lycopene is, uh, the bioavailability of lycopene is much increased uh, in, uh, it, it's found uh, generally in tomatoes and it's increased, the bioavailability is increased when those tomatoes are cooked. So um, it's, it's easier to, uh, to absorb and, and, and to, to, to be used by the body. So lycopene is another one that is of interest right now in the, the research around prostate cancer. Firefighters, you may also have heard that firefighters, um, it, it's, quite, uh, it's quite puzzling where there's a lot of recent study that have uh, reported a higher risk of prostate cancer in firefighters. Um, it could be that it's associated with shift work, which is also another factor that uh, we can talk about uh, in relation to prostate cancer. It could be in the chemicals that are released by that are released by the fire, the smoke, and the environment of the firefighters. Stress, because these are um, very demanding jobs when they go on site and so on. So firefighters are really under the spotlight now in terms of uh, the risk uh, of prostate cancer. And the International Agency for Research on Cancer just reviewed the overall evidence on this. 
and they uh, did not uh, ascribe uh, uh, they said that there's only still limited evidence uh, in humans, but it's basically that the studies are not large enough for, the, you know, there were questions. So it's, it's uh, this is a group that is really under scrutiny in terms of uh, their association with prostate cancer. Night shift work. Um, has been classified by the international agency uh, as a probable carcinogen. And this is mostly based on evidence on breast cancer. But there is a suspicion that is also important in prostate cancer. And uh, because uh, long-term exposure to night shift work disrupts uh, the circadian rhythm and it, through other mechanisms, it could uh, result in an in, in increase risk of prostate cancer. So this is also another hot topic right now in terms of prostate cancer etiology, because it could be that, I mean, uh, the, our Montreal study, we didn't find a risk, but uh, I know that other studies like in in, uh, in Spain and in, Fran in France, they observed increased risk. But overall, when the overall uh, associations were reviewed recently by IARC, uh, they could not declare that there's something clear with prostate cancer. So it's still it's still a, a question mark. Now we've seen that the farmers and we've seen that the people exposed to pesticides and the firefighters uh, and the night shift work, work uh, workers are, are suspected to have higher risk. So, but what about the other uh, professional or environmental exposure? Um, there's a bunch of other chemicals that have uh, been associated with prostate cancer risk by uh, IARC, the international agency. And these include arsenic, uh, inorganic arsenic compounds, cadmium, uh, the uh, rubber manufacturing industry, thorium, uh, X-ray, gamma rays, and so on. So these are also uh, under suspicion. But we do see that there's a kind of a cloud of information about environmental exposure that uh, seems to be coming out. And these are, these are more recent uh, uh, ex, uh, investigations. So based on that, when I started my career, I decided that I should look at the environment. I had, um, I, I, you know, everybody is right now interested in the environment from many point of view, but it, it felt to me when I looked at the literature that we knew very, very little about environmental exposure and prostate cancer. So I conduct, I sort of set up a, a very large study on uh, the environmental exposures in prostate cancer. This study, this Montreal study is called Proteus, Pro for Prostate, E for Environment, S for Study. And I started that back in uh, 2000 and I was very happy to receive the substantial funding from a lot of uh, granting agencies to put it together. And uh, the the name uh, Proteus comes from the Greek mythology. We did have a sort of a little uh, a poll in around our students, and then we said, "How do we call that study?" And they said, that "One of them called and said, came and said, hey, why don't we call it Proteus?'" And I thought it was great because Proteus is a, a Greek god, um, a man of the an old man of the sea. And he assumes many forms. And for prostate cancer, we do know that there's the aggressive version and the non-aggressive version. And it's really hard to capture. We were having problem trying to find out which are the factors that are underlying this disease. So I, I just thought that, uh, and then it can foretell the future. So this is, I'll present to you Proteus, uh, a Montreal study. And I might add that this is the biggest study in the world that looks at environmental exposure as it's conducted to look at this only. There are some studies in the world that have been looking at pesticides and they are really, really solid, like the agricultural health study in the United States that look in, into uh, states where they have farming, uh, very, very uh, large uh, farming industry. Uh, this study is not made to look at pesticides, but everything else in terms of environment. So basically it is a case control study and a case control study is conducted of a group of cases and a group of controls that is set in Montreal that uh, started in 2005 and finished in and the data collection finished in 2012. 
and it includes men uh, of the Montreal area that, that are resident in Montreal, less than 76 years old. And at the end of the Codata collection, we had uh, nearly 2,000 cases uh, of newly uh, diagnosed cases of prostate cancer uh, that were diagnosed across hospitals in Montreal, which are, uh, you know, we were able to reach out to 80% of eligible patients. And then we do have uh, about 2,000 controls that have no history of prostate cancer that live in the same area. And we selected those from the electoral list of French electors. And we, the French has nothing to do with politics. It's just because it was easier to access the hospital for us, the French hospital. The English hospital were a little bit more difficult to, um, to have access to, uh, to the patients. And so we decided to focus because, you know, about you know, 75 or more of, of Montreal is French speaking. So we, we still have a very large coverage of, of the population. So our controls are selected from a similar group of French electors. But uh, I mean, it doesn't mean that it's not gen generalizable to English speaking people, but it, it was just a, a logistic uh, situation. And then the controls, or 2,000 controls, well, we had about 60% uh, of those that were eligible that accepted to contribute to our study. So what we had is a group of uh, six interviewers that went around Montreal during all those years, between 2005 and 2012, and went to the homes of those people that accepted to talk to us, our cases and our controls. And they did face-to-face -face interviews with them that were all, they were all trained to collect information for us. And they collected information on sociodemographic, lifestyle factor, medical factors. And a very important aspect, which is very specific to this study is a work history. And we'll talk a little bit more about it because we obtained a detailed description of each job held over the lifetime of our subjects. So, you know, following those interviews, we, they came out with piles and piles of information about each of the subjects, about the potential activities that were happening in their workplace. And uh, we are interested in the workplace because the chemicals in the workplace are often also found in the general environment, but at, at lower level. And it's hard to measure low level exposure. But if you are able to see something at high level of exposure in the workplace, then this gives us a clue that there might be something going on in the in, in the general environment. Uh, the, so it's it gives us information about exposure to chemical basically in the population as a at large if you you know kind of uh, translate information from the workplace to the general environment and we also collected bio biological specimen and uh, some of this was used to do uh, conduct a genetic study from a saliva dna so this just gives you an idea of montreal this is the you may know that montreal is an island and we have a north shore and a south shore and this gives you a, an idea of the distribution of the cases in red and the controls uh, are in the Proteus study. So you, you can see that the guys are coming really from similar uh, area. And uh, now we'll just move on to uh, some findings from the Proteus study that have come out um, in, more recently. The first one was extremely puzzling, and uh, it, it, it was on traffic-related pollution and prostate cancer. This was the first time that we were interested in this, but we had a uh, suspicion that it could be important, that, because in the traffic pollution, there's all kinds of things. Uh, first of all, uh, vehicular traffic is, is the primary contributor to a, air pollution in urban areas such as Montreal or other Canadian uh, you know, cities. And in the vehicular emissions, there's gases, particles, vol volatile organic compounds, some of which are carcinogens. So it makes sense to study that. And also there are some chemicals the polycyclic ar aromatic hydrocarbons and benzoapyrene that have hormone modulating properties. And it could be that being exposed to, you know, uh, chemicals that have modulating properties in the long run could be problematic. So that was our research question. Let's have a look and see if we see something. That was really the first study, uh, I think, in the world to look at that. 
And so how did we do that? Well, we had information on the current address of each of our sub of 40,000 subjects. And we estimated the air pollution uh, uh, at this address by measuring the level of chemicals in the air of those around where they reside. And we measured something called nitrogen dioxide, NO2, which is a very good marker of traffic related pollution. And we installed little samplers, 129 of them at three, uh, at three different seasons in at different locations in Montreal. So our graduate student, they came around and they went and they, you can see above here uh, the head of one of our students. This is a sampler that he installed and the, that was capturing the NO2 and recording information. And there were some, you know, around the houses. I know that there was one near my house. And uh, basically this is again, the island of Montreal. And in red is where those 139 samples were installed. And there are also some in green crosses are fixed monitors that are there from Environment Canada. So we could see that um, we could capture the information about the level of uh, NO2 in the air around the residents of our study subjects that live around here. And so what was done is that there was some kind of a mapping by clever people that do prediction models based on you know, it could be, it takes into account the, the level of traffic, the number of cars, the, the, the proximity to the roads and the information from the samplers. And they were able to derive, to predict the NO2, uh, nitrogen dioxide across the island of Montreal. And we can see this is the infamous metropolitan highway that is congested 24 hours a day. And that one too, this is the Highway 15 and this, and then we see here that there's very little because this is the Mount Royal, which is a mountain where, uh, where we, there are very few parks. And yeah, this is a Parc Mont Royal, so it's a tree area. So, I mean, we can look and it makes a lot of sense what we see here. So, and this is the downtown area of Montreal. So what did we find? We found that greater residential exposure to NO2 that was used as a marker of traffic-related air pollution was associated with an increased risk of prostate cancer. And I must say that when we tried to publish that in the very you know, good journals, and we're aiming only at the best because we want to be reviewed by the best people as well, and so on, we had a problem because they didn't believe in it. They said, well, really, this is this is interesting. We don't we're not sure. And what we I mean, this is a very well conducted study. We tried to adjust for all kinds of other factors that we call con confounding factors that, you know, could exp be alternative explanation. And we could not find I mean, our, our association were very rob robust. So that was probably one of the first studies in the world to look at pollution and prostate cancer, and we did see something. Uh, now I'm going to move on to another residential exposure, and this one is a residential greenness. Residential greenness, it's parked around you, parks around your house, or, um, you know, trees, lots of trees, and so on, and prostate cancer risk. And this was also one of the first study on the subject. So residential greenness, it's known to have beneficial effects for uh, a number of uh, health uh, issues. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good for um, physical activity. It, it promotes social contacts with people that you talk with the guy or the, the lady that has a dog and uh, friends sitting on a bench or so on. So it, it promotes, you know, a physical, a soft physical activity, just go walking a little bit more. It also is associated with lower risk of being obese and lower exposure to air pollution. And each of them could influence prostate cancer risk. So how did we do that? Well, what we did is, is use the current address of our 40,000 40, subjects. And we use satellite, satellite images that are available of the Montreal region to estimate greenness at each address. So basically, those satellites gives us uh, information that allow us to calculate what we call a normalized difference vegetation index, NDVI. 
and it uh, indicates if the target contains live green vegetation. And if the, the NDVI is elevated, there's lots of greens. And if it's very low, uh, it, it there's it's you know rocks and and cement and 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 so on. So we could, with this information, with the satellite information and the address of our subject, we could associate the greenness around the residence, both at the time of diagnosis and ten years earlier, and even uh, further uh, er, earlier. What did we see? We saw a pretty strong protective association uh, of greenness against prostate cancer. So the men that live in greener areas seem to have lesser risk of prostate cancer. And this was after adjustment for air pollution, for socioeconomic factors, because sometimes it could be that those people that live in green environment might have a higher socioeconomic profile and it means they're more educated they might eat a little better they might be more you know aware uh, of health issues and so on but we did see an, an association and it came out in the one of the biggest journal in in in, in this area so we were reviewed and it, it was actually one of the first studies to demonstrate that and it has been replicated after by other people in the world so we looked at the uh, air pollution, and I've so, shown you stuff about NO2, but we also did other type of uh, particles in the air pollution, PM 2.5. We did the uh, in, uh, studies on um, small, the smaller one particle, uh, part, the small, small one partic particles. We also look at uh, aspects of, of, of pollution, and all of them came out positive in association with prostate cancer. So there's a signal there that is quite interesting that needs to be substantiated and looked at further. Another study we did was on air alcohol consumption because there were studies that were showing something, others not, and we thought that we would be looking at this. And uh, so we looked at the consumption of the oh, across the lifetime of individuals and because the alcohol uh, alcoholic beverages uh, contain some components that are carcinogens themselves ethanol and acetaldehyde which is a, a, a product of the oxidation of ethanol so there was a mechanism that was behind this this idea of looking at alcohol and what we did is that when our interviewers were uh, with our subjects, we asked them to give us information about the amount of beer, wine, and spirits that they were uh, they have been using uh, all along their life, and it, it could be that it changes over time. So we did have you know when it started at a certain level, when it ended, the number of glasses per day per week per month, and we were able to calculate an overall index for each of the different uh, uh, type of alcohols, but also combined. And we could look at the, at the time periods, the number of drinks and the frequency. And what we saw is that those who were uh, 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 the higher user of alcohol uh, were uh, tended to have higher risk of aggressive prostate cancer. Uh, those who were using it not as much were not, you know, at increased risk. It, it was really among the higher users. And it was mostly reflective of the intake of beers because, well, in Quebec, uh, I, I, we're not talking uh, Europe here. There, is not, there wasn't much wine. Uh, there was a little spirit being used, but beer was uh, the, uh, the beverage of choice by the population because we're talking lifetime here. Right now, there's much, uh, the, the patterns have changed, but in the years that are subject, you know, when you look back, beer was the, the main contributing uh, beverage. So we did see an association with alcohol and aggressive prostate cancer. Another study we did, which is actually very, uh, also quite innovative, is, is a, a study on marital status and prostate cancer incidence. This study we conducted on Proteus, but I'm presenting here another larger study that was done by pooling information from 12 case control studies conducted in the world. And the information from all of these studies is um, within, uh, it, it's part of a consortium, which I am a member of, and I have access to these data. So uh, basically, 
um, we were interested in a marital status for different reasons. Um, because being in a couple tend to promote a healthier lifestyle. It has been, you know, looked at and people that are uh, in, in couple, when I say marital, it's either married or living as married. Uh, they tend to have a healthier lifestyle, smoke less, have a better diet, uh, engage a little bit more in physical activity. They tend to have a higher social support. Uh, which could be a, uh, a, a mechanism to reduce stress. And uh, there is also an increase in the likelihood of earlier disease detection because we, there are studies that show that in a couple, the lady tends to go to have a mammogram every two years, three years, depending. And uh, she will encourage the partner to go and have himself tested. So it, it could be through that, um, that uh, there's also an increased uh, uh, detection uh, amongst couple. And so it, it might be detected an, at an earlier stage. And so all of these could be involved in the associ association with prostate cancer risk. So uh, basically we use, as I said, the population from practical uh, that is actually set to look at genetic factors, but they also have epidemiological factors collected. And uh, we uh, looked at 12 studies and the subjects were asked, each of those subjects were asked about the marital status at diagnosis or, or interview. And at the end of the day, and it was a very big study, I think we had, oh my God, I'm, I'm blanking on the, the, the actual number of people, but it's it's several, uh, it maybe 50,000 people overall or more, it's, it's a very big population. And what we found is that the widowers at elevated risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer, especially advanced prostate cancer that has spread at the time of detection, and that's uh, important because, um, and we also that sing observed that single men at increased risk of aggr aggressive prostate cancer. And that's important because it kind of identifies a vulnerable, vulnerable population that might benefit from closer contact, you know, better social support, maybe closer fo medical fo follow-up and so on. So uh, we were one of the first to, uh, actually observe that and I think it might be useful in the long run. I'm just going to brush now a few ideas about our ongoing work. Uh, we're we're going to work on light at night pollution. You may have heard that uh, there's some concern that the blue light that uh, is now being used in a lot of cities, the modern cities, they change from you know the kind of yellow light to the blue light. And, and so on. And there's a concern that this could be more problematic for health. And so we are interested in looking at whether exposure to blue light, because it inf influences the circadian rhythms. If there's a lot of blue light in your environment, you might sleep less, you are exposed to light, and it, this might impact circadian rhythms in individuals. So we are looking into that in, in one of our studies. I have a a brilliant doctoral students that is working on this. We also are interested in physical inactivity. We saw that, you know, obesity seems to be associated with aggressive prostate cancer, but it, there's also a suspicion that inactivity, uh, sedentariness that is increasing now in the population is, is almost like the new smoking. It, it really could be a, a, an issue. And, and so we're gonna be looking into that in our next studies. Uh, we have collected the information and we are able to look at this both during leisure time, but also in the workplace, which is the specialty of, of our study. We are interested in looking at chemicals because in our study, we collected information on each job held by our subjects. And the information has been looked at by very specialized industrial hygienists. And they looked at the task that the people were doing, the, chem the, the, me the protective measures, the equipment that uh, they were um, uh, using and so on. And those chemists, industrial hygienists, have inferred exposure to each of our subject to 300 chemicals over the lifetime. So we have a wealth of study that is unparalleled. And we want to look at them not only individually, but as cocktails, because 
in the real life, it's not one chemical that occurs around you. It often comes with others. And we have an interest in, in, in looking at all of them. But that requires very sophisticated method to entangle, uh, disentangle the, the exposures that come in, in multiple exposure that occur at the same time. And we are also interested in trying to find out, are there factors in people, uh, around the people that could make the, uh, uh, the, the, the cancer progress more than others. And it, it's it's uh, something that we are interested in and uh, there's not much work on this so far. So it, it's gonna be quite interesting. And then, and then I said, I would just talk very briefly about uh, prostate cancer screening. It's not my area, but I thought I'd just look at it and, and, and look at the literature. And, and really it, this is uh, your personal uh, physician that is the person to help you with this. But I just thought I'd look into what are the current recommendations. And, and, and from what I saw, the Canadian Cancer Society, the Canadian Neurological Association, they have different recommendations depending on the level of risk. And uh, for the men that are perceived to have higher risk based on uh, uh, either their ancestry or their family history, um, there seems to be a suggestion to consider testing from age uh, 45. And while for the others with a life expect expectancy greater than 10 years, there's a they apparently they should consider testing from age 50 and uh, the test results will define determine how often uh, if one looks at the canadian task force which is 2014 so this is starting to be a bit old uh, they recommend not screening for prostate cancer for all age group uh, but uh, we expect an update shortly it might change because it depends if you look at the united states if you look at different agencies they they boil the evidence in different, you know, different recommendations. But this is what uh, we could find uh, really around what's going on in Canada. And uh, there seems to be a common ground that uh, the screening should be an informed decision with the healthcare provider. Uh, discussion about the uncertainties of those tests, which are not perfect, the risks of having them, and the potential benefits. So I think that concludes. Uh, pretty much my my talk. Um, I think the future will tell us more. I think you've you've seen that we know some, but we are, you know, still very much in deep into the research, trying to find out the factors. But I, my my focus on on the environment, I think it's it's it, it's worth pursuing because it's not been done before very much. And uh, I think we have clues that there should be something there. So our study is very rich and we have thousands of factors to analyze and publish. And uh, we hope that, you know, identifying risk factor will help us um, prevent prostate cancer. And, and, and one way this happens is that whenever our team publishes uh, results on chemicals, for instance, and prostate cancer risk, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is located in, uh, in, in Europe, in France, they take that evidence and they look at this evidence with all the other evidence that come from other people around the world and other groups and they statute on the carcinogenicity of risk factors and then they'll say they, they might declare that this factor is a definite carcinogen for prostate cancer and when that happens then it means that the, the it, it it becomes a benchmark to regulate. And so the industries have to change their act, they have to put their act together, the public health department. So at the end of the day, what we find here goes to big agencies that are boiling over our information with, you know, uh, it could be with toxicological evidence and so on. And then they make recommendation as to the classification of the the the, the, the chemical or or the factor. And then this actually makes um, makes into public health guidelines. And then at the end of the day, it protects people against the disease. So um, I'm going to stop here. Um, and I'm, I just want to raise um, the amazing um, uh, agencies that have helped us uh,